you're ready. I'm good. I was doing that a little bit, and then I just did this. And it should hold there. It should click right back. If it if it freezes, just the little switch on the gray one. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us today for Church at Home with Cornerstone Church Airdrie. If you're new to Cornerstone Church or perhaps joining us for the first time, my name is Brad and I have the privilege of serving as the lead campus pastor here. And I want to welcome you to our service today. As always, I want to invite you to make the most of our time together. As, as we watch from home, there's a million things that can demand our attention and a million and one things that, that can pull us away from, from what we're trying to do. And so I want to encourage you to be as intentional as you can about being focused on our time together. Watching on a phone or a computer or even a TV gives us opportunities to remain emotionally, intellectually, and relationally distant from what's going on. And, and that will be the case unless we choose to not allow that to happen. So, so make that choice today. Even right now, make that choice. Being online, though, does give us one of the, the greatest opportunities that we will ever have to invite our friends and our loved ones to church in the simplest, easiest, most unpressured kind of way. Just sh simply share the service to your Facebook page. Just, just simply start a watch party. Th this again, and I know I say this every week, but it just keeps happening every single week. People keep telling me, you won't believe who watched. I can't believe. And they invited their mom next week. And, and just over and over again, these stories of people who are watching our services is, is this is something that God is doing right now. And you can play a part in it if you, if you just simply share or start a watch party. And I want to encourage you, if you're watching on Facebook, to interact with each other as, as the service goes on. Say hi to each other and then say hi to each other when someone else says hi. Say amen. Worship together. Click the reaction buttons. It, this is a time for connection with each other. So, so let's not miss this. But before we begin, I just want to share a few notes about some of the things going on in our church over the next little while. First, I just want to let you know about our Cornerstone Kids um, stuff that we have going on is, is we've been able to, to increase the amount of resources we have available for, for our at-home kids ministry. Um, we now have videos available for each of the classes for, for our Littles Nursery, or for our Minis Nursery, the Littles class and the Bigs class. Each class will have their own video. Each video will have their own parent guides to walk your kids through what you just watched and activities for the whole week. If you're watching on Facebook, just click on the link Links for church at home and it'll take you to our webpage and they'll be there if, if you are watching on the website just scroll down and they're all available there as well we're really excited also on on our website on, on under each ministry there are, are helpful guides for parents and in, in discussing or tips for how to discuss anxiety and panic and different things like that with your kids as we move through this season and so we just want to make as much available as we can to you for this time the next thing that I want to just mentioned to you is, is we've been working really hard. We have, we have a team of people that's been working really hard to reach out to everybody inside of our church. And we're looking to grow that team. And um, we're looking to, to find some more people to be a part of that. If you would like to be a part of that team, really all it takes is making one or two phone calls or texts or emails a day. And so if you want to be a part of that team, you can let me know. Especially, you know, one of the things that I've heard a lot is, I'm so extroverted, I just want to talk to people. Here's a chance to, to, to make a point of calling and contacting people. I also want to let you know that if, if you are watching this with us and you're new to Cornerstone Church either today or over the next little while, we have a couple of things available for you. First, if you're watching on Facebook, we have a digital connection card that's available in the video description. If you just click on there, there's a short form. It's eight questions and you can just go through and, and give us, let us know who you are that you're watching and, and we'll make sure to be in contact with you and, and be, invite you you in to be a part of our church family. If you're watching on our website, you can just scroll down to the bottom of the page and the digital connection card is there as well. As well on, on, on um, 
the Facebook page and, and our website, there's a place where you could or request pastoral contact, pastoral care. That if you need a pastor to be in contact with you right now, if you need to talk to me or to Matt for whatever reason, you can just click on there and there's a real short form to fill out and we will be in contact with you as soon as you can. But we want to be in contact with each other. The next thing that I want to let you know is on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we're having our next online prayer time. We had such a, a wonderful time. There was a handful of us gathered together last Wednesday. And I'm hoping to see more of that. I really am convicted that we need to be praying. And so this is an opportunity. It's, it's online and it's over a program called Zoom. We'll have the link up. If you don't know how to use Zoom and you'd like to be a part, but you're insecure or whatever, just contact me and I will walk you through it step by step. And I will make sure that you get to be a part of our prayer time together. It's significant and it's important. And I want to invite you to be a part of it. Next, I want to just let you know, starting April 28th, we're going to start an online small group um, on Tuesday nights at 6.30 or 7, I can't remember. It's on the website. One of those two is when it's going to start. But we're going to be together for one hour, and we're going to be doing a study called um, Dealing with Anxiety During COVID-19. And we're just going to walk through some, some practical things and, and understand some biblical principles as we deal with this time and this season that we are in. The next two announcements are, are related together, but first, I want to tell you about our guys night in. On, on Thursday, April 30th, we're going to have just a time of hanging out together as the guys in the church. Um, we're going to be together just to chat, socialize, catch up, see where everybody's at and see what's going on. It's, it'll be a Thursday night, whichever, at 6.30 or 7. I think this one is at 7 and the other one was at 6.30. I don't really remember. But either way, we're going to be together and it's going to be totally informal and just a hangout time where we can get to catch up with one another. The reasons why they're related is because the women in the church are already invited to do this with mom life. They've been getting together for Fridays, some Friday mornings, some Friday nights, and just being together and socializing and, and catching up. Um, it's a real blessing, and I know that, that it's been a real blessing for those who have been involved in it. You can find all of the details for these, these social gatherings on, online through our website. If you're watching on Facebook, there's a link that says for all upcoming events, and you can just click there. All that information will be there. The last thing that I want to let you know is just about our online Bible study, If God is for Us. One of the things that's really crucial for us as believers and for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is that when, when we are, are given an opportunity to press in, we take advantage of it. When we're given an opportunity, or when, when some of these things are stripped away and, and we suddenly don't have our small group to go to, and we can't go to the church and we can't go to church and all of those things, sometimes some of the things that we really need to press into in our lives can sort of fall away a little bit. And so I want to encourage you, this is available online. We've got five sessions going for the, so far, going through the first three chapters of Joshua. Every Thursday, I'll upload a new video um, of, of what's going on. And so you can just be a part of that if you'd like to. It's, it's really a wonderful time. That's all I'm going to say for now. So I'm going to uh, pray and then Jordan and Matt are going to come and lead us in worship. Father God, I thank you for today and I thank you for this chance to be together. God, I pray that as we gather together to worship and as we gather together to hear from your word, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be speaking to us, that your Holy Spirit would be working through us, that, that we would be encountering your presence in our living rooms and in our dens and here in the church as we're here. And God, wherever we are this morning, God, that your, your presence that, that is everywhere would make itself evident in our lives. God, I pray against distractions and against the things that would pull us away from what we're trying to do this morning, but God, that we would be able to have our eyes and our hearts focused on you, focused on worshiping you, on loving you, and from hearing from you. God, take this time and use it to really shape us and make us and mold us. God, we love you and we look forward to everything you have for us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. everybody. Um, we want to continue in the spirit of Easter as we enter into Easter Tide, um, the season where we reflect and live in the wake of resurrection. 
and a part of that process is entering into this new sermon series on the Psalms and and learning how to pray through those and and so we want to uh, encourage you to turn to Psalm 3 and, and Brad will be there later but I want to encourage you to turn to the Psalm 3 right now and open that up and read it and come back to it throughout the service as we sing and as we worship feel that freedom to go silent and just read read aloud turn us down and, and turn God up uh, spend time listening um, take advantage of some of the unique space that is uh, worshiping at home um, and the way you can kind of craft that space for yourself um, well we're going to start with reading Psalm 3 and we're going to enter into some music together Psalm 3 says, O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him and God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Yeah. 
Count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out Working them all for my good
One with God, the most high, hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. i 
beautiful name is the name of Jesus Christ my Lord. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. And may your blessing rest upon as we continue in this morning, wherever we are, we know that your spirit has met us there. Your spirit is meeting all of us where we are. Just before we, we share our message on, on Psalm chapter 3, the, the third Sunday of the month, or we do our best on the third Sunday of the month to, to focus on missions and our missionaries that are serving all over the world. But rather than highlighting a mission or a ministry this month, I, I wanted to take our, our missions time and have a, a little bit of a different focus. Um, th this COVID-19 coronavirus stuff, it's an issue for the entire world right now. And, and that includes our missionaries that are half a world away from their families and from their communities. And we, we had an opportunity to pray together as, as pastors and leaders from all across Foursquare on Friday morning. And w Lizzie Jorgensen, who's, who's part of our, our missions leadership team, sh serves on our national missions leadership team, and also pastors a wonderful church in, in Kimberly, BC, Summit Church, and her and her husband husband Tyler or some of our, our dearest friends, she prayed and her prayer really spoke to me. And so I've invited Lizzie, who, who pastors this church and serves on our national leadership team. She's going to actually lead us in prayer this morning for our missionaries in this extraordinary time. Hi, Cornerstone. Uh, Pastor Brad got a hold of me this week and just asked if I would come into your service this week and and pray over our missionaries so i just want to take some time to do that this morning and i would ask that you guys would just pray along with me um there's a verse that i want to read to start that has been on my heart as i've been praying for our missionaries serving all over the world and it's from matthew chapter 19 and it's verse 29 it says everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for our missionaries that are serving. I thank you for the Brazis serving in Germany, for the Kelly serving in Estonia, and for the Davidson Marenko family who are serving in Costa Rica. Jesus, they have left everything to follow after you. They have left family. They've left their native land. They've left their, their mothers, their fathers, their brothers, and their sisters to be about your business and to be serving you. So Jesus, right now, we just pray that you would bless them wherever they are. Lord, I pray that you would watch over them and give them peace in this time of uncertainty. Jesus, I pray that in the midst of COVID-19, that they would not be walking in fear, but that they would be more filled with faith than they ever have been before. Jesus, I pray specifically for the children that are serving. God, I pray that you would give them an understanding that goes way beyond their years. Jesus, as they just put their faith and their trust in you, I pray that you would pour out your peace and your joy upon each little one. God, that they continue to walk in faith and continue to trust you. Jesus, I pray that you would continue to provide for our missionaries as the economy is being hit very hard right now and in the months to come. I pray that our missionaries would not feel that, but that they would feel just an, an overabundance, that you are just pouring out your blessing and your provision for each one. Jesus, we pray for continued health and safety for each one of them. And Lord, I also pray that you would 
give them new vision, fresh vision for how to reach into their communities in a time of isolation. So Lord, we pray that you would give them um, just that, that creativity that comes from you to look out at the needs that are around them and to say, this is what we can do, and that that would be a directive straight from you. So Lord, we stand with them today, and we hold them up, and we ask that you would continue to bless them, continue to care for them, continue to shepherd them through this time. Jesus, you are good, and I thank you. Thank you so much, Lord. Amen. Would you just continue to pray for these missionary families during this, this week and in the months to come? They need our love and they need our support and they mostly need our prayers. All right. Thanks so much, Lizzie. We really appreciated your, your leadership and your, your prayer for our missionaries this morning. If you'd like to follow along with our text today, you can turn to Psalm chapter 3. We're starting a new sermon series this week called The Struggle is Real. And I think that hopefully it's going to be a really challenging series and a really changing series. And, and even more than that, I think for some... This will be a real eye-opening series in our relationship with God. What God expects and allows from us in our relationship with Him versus what we sometimes feel obligated to think that we need to be about. For the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at moments and times in our lives when we struggle, when things are hard, and the emotions that go along with that. And I want to be careful because it can be really easy for this series to somehow be all about, oh, it's about COVID-19. It's our COVID-19 sermon series. And the reason that I want to be careful with that is this. Yes, COVID-19 and social isolation are, are uh, for real, they're real, and for many people they are a struggle, and for some in our church it's been job loss as a result of that, but as I've made the, my way through being in touch with as many people as possible in, a in our church over the last little while, one thing I've discovered and one thing is very true. The rest of life has not stopped because of COVID-19. There have been so many things going on in our church on top of COVID-19 that I'm not looking to just talk to us for the next couple of weeks about simply dealing with COVID-19, but whatever you are facing, whatever you are struggling with, over the next few weeks, we're going to talk together through the emotions of struggling. Because as so many people will tell you, it's not what, or what you go through, it's how you go through it. And what that really comes down to is our emotions. Our emotions have so much influence on our lives and our situations and on our outlook and on just about everything. And there are really two extremes of emotions and how we deal with them. No emotions are shown or all emotions are shown. Everything needs to be pushed down, bottled up and never expressed or everything needs to come out all the time. Now maybe for you, you can hear yourself or your family in that, but it's important that we learn how to handle our emotions in a solid biblical way. Because God gives us our emotions. He gave you your emotions. He created you with them. They are there because he gave them to you. And so that means that God isn't caught off guard by us feeling things, by us reacting to things, because he's the one who gave them to us. But for so many of us, when it comes to God, we can really fall into this first extreme of dealing with our emotions that, that somehow I need to push them down because emotions are sinful especially if it's any kind of negative emotion, that, that if I'm feeling fearful or anxious or doubting or hurt or angry, that somehow I just need to cram those down and pretend they're not there, that somehow if I, if I do that, or some, because somehow they're ungodly, and if I try and hide them, then, then maybe God won't know that I'm feeling that way. Now, objectively, we know how silly that can sound. I'm going to hide this from the God that knows everything. But yet, we all still can find ourselves doing that. But the truth is, God knows how you're feeling. God put all of those emotions inside of you. He created you with them. But we do need to learn how to deal with them. 
And that's what we're going to do over the next few weeks, is we're going to use the Psalms and the language of the Psalms to help us learn how to pray through our emotional responses to the times when we struggle, to discover what it looks like to talk to God in the midst of our struggle. One of the amazing things as you read through the book of Psalms is to see just how often Jesus did this. How often throughout his life, when he prayed and when he dealt with trying times, his heart and his mind made their way back to the Psalms and he prayed the language of the Psalms. We're going to see the struggle that the psalmist went through and how we can hopefully be released to to not find guilt and shame in our struggle but to discover that it's not sinful to struggle, but to see how they process the emotions of struggling to lead them through to the other side of the struggle, how to pray through our emotions in the presence of God. A reflective, intentional processing before God about understanding the source of our emotions and sorting through them the cause and the effect, how they relate to my view of God, myself, and to other people, and how we can just pour out the whole mess in God's presence. That's prayer. That's biblical prayer. And that's what praying through our emotions looks like. And so this week, we're going to begin this journey by looking at Psalm chapter 3. And next week, or, or this week, we're going to explore what it means to pray through our fears. Our fears and our anxieties, not to stuff them down and to deny them, but not also to let them take over us, but to pray through them in the presence of God and process our fears and our worries before him. Now, Psalm chapter 3 is a psalm written by David, the boy who killed Goliath, the boy who was chosen to be God's king, and the man who went through a whole lot in his life. And it was written at a point in his life where he was on the run from his life from his son who wanted to kill him. And it's very clear that he's terrified. And the first thing that he does in the psalm, in this prayer, is to draw attention to all of the things that have him freaked out, that have him fearful. In verse 1, he says, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? There are a whole bunch of people, and they all want to kill him. And people all around him are saying to him, you know, you're going to die. Even God can't save you. That's a pretty good reason to be fearful. Now, Sometimes as, as Christians, we can stumble into this idea that we as followers of Jesus shouldn't fear. And I don't necessarily mean fear like going on a roller coaster for the first time kind of fear. At Callaway Park, we don't say to our kids when we go on the roller coaster, you know, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. But it's in this more existential, circumstantial life kind of way that we as Christians feel that we shouldn't feel or acknowledge fear. At the beginning of this pandemic, so, so, so many people quoted the verse in 2 Timothy that says, for God did not give us a spirit of fear. And that's true, and it's accurate. But that didn't and that doesn't mean that it's wrong to have experienced fear. We just need God to help us process our way through it. We need to learn how to pray through our fears, not to stuff them down and deny them because they will end up destroying you, but also not to give reign and rule to them and let them take over your life because they will end up destroying you as well, just in a different way. We have to learn how to face them and pray through them, and that's what David is doing in Psalm chapter 3. And so we need some context as to what's going on and why David was going to say these things that he's saying here. And so... As we said, David is on the run from his son Absalom. David's time as king was coming to an end. David's son had essentially formed a resistance and staged a coup, a successful coup against his father. The whole story of this is found in 2 Samuel chapter 15, if you'd like to read that. But David has to flee his own house, the city that he established as the capital city of Israel. And he runs into the hills with just a couple hundred people who remained loyal to him. Now, a couple hundred people may, may seem like a lot, but we're told that there's an army of 12,000 foot soldiers coming after him. So, so you can just imagine the fear and, and the unknown that he's experiencing in these moments. And so, so David begins his prayer by first identifying the source of his fear. We're going to see this as a model for prayer. So the first thing that he does is he identifies the source of his fear to God's attention. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. Some of your translations may say something like, there is no salvation for him. And I want to highlight for you something here that's repeated in the, these first couple of verses. We can get a hint at what's really freaking him out the most 
by what's repeated here three times in these couple of verses. In these verses, David points out again and again and again how many people there are against him. There are 12,000 soldiers coming to get him. This, this is the source of the fear that he brings to God. 12,000 people want to kill me. Good reason to be afraid. But it runs even deeper than just the 12,000 people looking to kill David. It's also found in their taunts and their propaganda. It's in the message his enemies are saying. They're saying, God's through with David. In other words, it's not that they're saying they don't believe in God. It's not that they're saying they've rejected God. But instead, they're saying that David isn't God's plan anymore. God is done with him, and there's no favor or salvation for David from God. And this is a very different kind of attack. This isn't a physical 12,000 people are trying to kill me thing. That may be a little tough for us to relate to. But instead, this is an emotional, more existential kind of attack. This is an attack on David's identity and his self-perception. And this is important because we have to remember where David came from, how he became king. David was a no-name shepherd boy. He, he was the littlest brother of a large family of boys, and the littlest in both age and stature. And then one day, one of the most important prophets in all of Israel shows up to his family's house and tells his dad that God has chosen one of his sons to be the next king of Israel. And David is so no-name that his dad doesn't even invite him to this. He invites all of his other brothers, but not David. Because in reality, in his dad's mind, it's not going to be David. But as the prophet Samuel looks at the boys, he knows that it's not any of them. So he says to David's dad, do you have any more boys? And David's dad said, yeah, I have this, this little runt, but it's not him. And the prophet says, yeah, yeah, that's him. That's the guy. And that's the story of David. This, this no-name runt of a shepherd boy is chosen by God himself to be the king of Israel. And so what Absalom, David's son, and his army are saying here is, God is through with David now. He may have been God's chosen, but not anymore. So it's not just his life that's being threatened, but it's also his identity. Who is David if he's not God's chosen anymore? And right now it seems that he isn't, and that's what the people are calling into question. Now, you may not be able to identify with 12,000 people trying to kill you. In fact, I pray that you cannot now, nor will you ever have that number of people trying to kill you. Although right now, the fear may not, have be, may not be of people trying to kill you, but the fear may be a virus, a looming medical threat to your life, and that may be a source of fear. But perhaps this second one can ring a little more of a bell in your life. You place your place in the world, you, your identity in losing those things, your life not going down the path you thought it would that you never would have imagined this is where you'd find yourself. And that leading you with fear or to fear and anxiety. How do I get back from here? How, how do I live here? How does this become my life? And leaving us in a place of fear and worry. Some version of that may be more identifiable for you than the physical fear. But for us today, what, what we want to see in this is that David identifies what's causing him fear and it brings him to God. He doesn't try or hide or pretend that, that it doesn't exist. He comes to God freely and openly and says to God, this is what's going on in my life. This is what is causing me fear. And so how does he pray through this, this existence of fear in God's presence? He does this over the next couple of verses, and it's really brilliant and insightful and powerful for us. In verse 3, he says, But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. You see here the tone begin to shift. Something really profound has taken place in this very fearful and anxious man. Now the first and most obvious thing that happens here is he moves his perception and his thoughts from his circumstances onto God and onto God's character. It's part of how he processes his fear. He identifies the source, but, but then he turns his attention laser-like back to God and he speaks about God in these images. 
And this is one of the most challenging things about the Psalms, is that God is often described in these poetic image kind of ways. And when we read them, they can sound very Bible-y, but not always as pictures that work in our lives, that work in my life and experience. So we read them and, and we can move on. But we need to stop and think about why David would choose these three metaphors for God in this specific time and this specific place. First, he says that the Lord is a shield, a shield around him. So if we stop, or so if we think about the shield, this one kind of makes sense. A shield we would typically see as protection, protection from the bad things. And so David is seeing God as his protection from all of the bad things that are closing in around him. But it's crucial that we understand what a shield does not do. A shield does not prevent bad things from happening. A shield is not preventative. It's protective when bad things do happen. And so in other words, David is not putting his faith in God, or David is not putting his faith in God to only prevent the bad things from happening, but to be his protection when they do. And why this is important for us to understand is that as we pray through our fears, as we identify the source of our fears, for, for many of us, and certainly it's certainly true for me, that when hardship hits our lives, or we go through seasons of confusion or tragedy, one of our basic assumptions that we go through is that God is going to spare me from all of this. And if he doesn't, it must be a sign that God has abandoned me. But when we dig deeper into that thought and into this process of thinking, what we discover is that our, our assumptions about God are that his role in my life is to keep me from anything bad or to keep anything bad from happening in my life, so I'm always content and happy. And you're welcome to believe in that God. But I would warn you to not try and connect that God to anything to do with the God in the Bible. Because that's not the promise that the God in the Bible makes. The promise of the God in the Bible is that when this broken world, broken by my sin, broken by human sin, that in this broken world, when horrible things happen, it's not that God doesn't love us, but in those moments, we discover that God is right there with us. What David is essentially recognizing here is that in this season of struggle and fear might be the closest that he ever has been to God. And, and this is part of the paradox of suffering in the scriptures. Now, sometimes the God of the Bible does rescue his people from difficult situations. But sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes that season is exactly what he is using to shape the hearts and the minds and the character of the people he loves so dearly. And so he calls God his shield. And then he calls God his glory. Now let's stop and think about that for a moment. What does it mean and why would he need to say that? Now the word glory might trip some of us up here because again, it's a pretty religious, bible sounding word to take into the context of our own lives. But the word that's used here is a Hebrew word and the Hebrew word is kabod. Now this word in its most literal meaning is just something that is heavy. In the book of Judges, there is this king named Eglon and he is very very overweight, and he's called kabod. So it just literally means something heavy. But the, that image of heaviness with, with the word kabod is often used as a metaphor for something that is significant or important, something that is weighty. And it's this idea we have in English as well. We will talk about a subject or, or a time as being heavy, not literally heavy, but, but emotionally, and it has this weight and significance. And so for David, in his whole rags to riches story, this no-name shepherd boy, to becoming this great king, what defined him was this story. But now he doesn't have that importance. He doesn't have that significance, this, this weight behind his name and this identity anymore. He's lost everything that made King David, King David. And so why at this moment, at this low point in his life, why would David have to, to say, and in a new way, God, you are my kabod. You are the thing that gives me significance, identity, meaning, and purpose in life. 
Clearly, he has to say this because something else had done that for him in his life. Something else had become his kabod. And you can see this in his life. His wealth, his power, his significance had become his identity, his meaning, and his purpose in life. The story of Bathsheba and and her husband and all that David did and went through and, and committed in this shows us this. And when at last all of that crumbles, because who he is, who is he if he's not a king? And in this moment, suddenly his whole life and his experience are brought back into focus. And and he has this moment where he comes back to God and he says to God, God, I remember now that you are the only thing in my life that gives me purpose, that gives me weight, that gives me significance. Your attention, your care, your presence in my life is all I need to give me meaning and significance. And he has to take this moment of confession and realize that he has to place his kabod in the wrong, or he has placed his kabod in the wrong thing, and he needs to put it back in his right place. So back to the metaphors. He says that God is his shield, that God is his glory, and then he says that God is the one who holds his head up. And, and this means essentially the same thing that it does in the English. When we say, hold your head up high, it means to be confident. And so he's essentially saying, I don't have any reason to be confident in myself anymore. And he takes his attention away from himself. And he says to God, you are what allows me to hold my head high. Even though by everything around me, I look like an utter failure and everyone knows it and everyone is saying it, that I am an utter failure. You are my glory and you hold my head up high. And so We think about this, and when we see our lives in shambles, a total mess, we might think that, think of that as as a lack of God's favor and God's blessing on our lives, or, or perhaps that God is angry at you. But in this moment, David grounds himself in his belief that even with everything falling down around him, that God is still with him and for him in this moment. So how can he know that? Look, look at what he says next. He says, I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. He says, I'm praying to you and I know that you will answer me. He's super confident in God's presence in his life. But how can he be so confident about this? It, it has nothing to do with, every, with him, but everything to do with where he says that God is going to answer him from. David says, his holy mountain, or some of your translations may say his holy hill. And this is another thing that we can read and don't really know or understand what this means and just keep going. But David is referring here as as to, to here as God's holy hill or mountain. What he's referring to here is the city of Jerusalem. And and on the, the highest hill in the city of Jerusalem is where David set up the tabernacle the very dwelling place of God, where where later the temple was going to be built. So essentially, what David is saying here is, I know that you will answer me because you are in your tabernacle, the very hot spot of your presence. And to totally understand why this is reassuring to David is we need to to dig a little into the background again. In the courtyards of the tabernacle, on a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis— there were sacrifices being offered that would allow a very sinful, selfish man or even a disgraced king to look towards God and to know that he had been forgiven and shown grace, where animals were offered as a substitute for people's sins. So we see David looking towards this substitute and the picture of that sacrifice for grace and forgiveness that covers over his sin and gives him confidence that God always forgives him and is always for him. I hope that you're able to see how this thousands-year-old poem is relevant for us today. See, we're standing on the other side of the cross. Jesus was the ultimate substitute. His life and death and resurrection on our behalf covered our sins as Jesus absorbed into himself what we all deserved. And in his resurrection, he both provides a covering and a source of new life and grace for those who would turn toward him. And so this allows us to pray this prayer as followers of Jesus and to go on the same journey. So so we see David has made all of these confessions and realizations about himself and the place that he finds himself and his fears and his worries. 
And he comes to this place of reliance on God and his recognition of who God is and what God does in his life. And it, it allows him to do what? In verse 5 it says, I lie down to sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. He can finally get a good night's sleep. He identified the source of his anxiety and fear. He, he realigns his priorities again. He, he looked to a sacrificial substitute that was done for him. And he knows now that he can rest in God's mercy and grace. So he says that he lays down and sleeps and he wakes up and it's all because of God that he is not going to try and engineer his future. He's not going to try and make how he feels about where he finds himself. He's not going to allow his, how he feels about himself to affect his ability, and his, pro, his, his ability to process his life. He, he commits it all to God. And so now we look at what he can say in verse 6. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. And we can read that and we can think about this not as a metaphor, but his real situation. We can think, honestly, really, David? 10,000 people surrounding you, spears ready to go through your chest, and you're not afraid? But we're reading his prayer, and apparently he's reached this place where he's of the conviction that whatever happens even if he's going to have to face his worst fear and 10,000 people have captured him and are going to kill him, that he's not afraid anymore because he knows that God is his glory, his significance, his identity, and that God's commitment to him and his love for him is stronger than death. And so that puts him in this place of peace. But it does not cancel out his emotions. Look at verse 7. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw and break the teeth of the wicked. Now, David, if you don't have anything nice to say, David, we mustn't speak like that. David is not stuffing his emotions. He expresses how he feels and what he thinks God should do. His emotions are raw, and he's willing to express these thoughts to God. And instead of acting like they're not there, he prays through it. He vents. He pours out what he's feeling before God. He says, God, smash him. God, get him. God, lightning zap him from heaven. He pours out what he's feeling before God. And as a profound act of faith, he lets God know what he would like. And then he commits his enemies over to God and God's justice, and he asks God to take care of them. And all of this leads him to the last verse, to verse 8. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. I may want God to smash their faces in. I may want God to knock their teeth out. But if deliverance is going to come from somewhere, it's not going to come from me and what I want but it's going to come from God. Hopefully for, for you today, this is going to land, and for all of us, this is going to land in so many different ways for us. But I want to encourage you, if this story, if this prayer has spoken to you, to your season, to your fears and to your anxieties, to really think about what it would look like for you to take this same journey, to identify the source of fear and anxiety in your life, a situation, a person, a loss of identity or purpose, to dig to the root of what's freaking you out and what you're afraid of, and to actually come through this experience where we look at what are our fears trying to take away from us and where can we actually find a source of that that's not contingent on the things we're afraid of and to actually come through this experience of turning to God's character and turning to those circumstances and our desires and our wants and how we see these things turning out, turning that enemy over to God to find peace. I want to encourage you this morning to, to or I guess today, to, to do this with God, to, to spend some time with God and commit your fear to him and allow him to show you how he is the one where you can place your trust and everything that you're afraid of losing, everything that you're afraid of being done can be found in him. Let's pray this morning. 
Lord God, I thank you that in your word, God, we, we can look and we can find answers to prayer. We can find models of prayer. We can find ways to pray. And God, I thank you that as we look at this prayer that David prayed, God, we don't find the need to be fake. We don't find a need to somehow not express what's going on in our lives. But God, I thank you that we discover that you, God, our creator, are so aware of your creation. You're so in touch with your creation that we don't have to put on a pretend. We don't have to put on an act to come to you and pray. But God, in the midst of our emotional breakdown, in the midst of our fear and our anxiety, God, we can come to you. We can pray. We can vent. God, we can let you know what's going on in your lives and and in our lives. And, And God, what we don't see is you turning your back on David. But what we see is you walking him through this journey of faith and this journey of fear and bringing him through to the other side where he's able to recognize that his deliverance will come by you and that he can place his trust in you. And so God, I pray for each one here today that may be dealing with those same things. Each person that may be dealing with with fear and anxiety, God, would you allow them to go through this process? Would you take them on this journey? God, as they invite you in and they invite you to go on this journey with him, God, would you, would you take them on this journey, bring them through to the other side, and God, allow for this to be a time and a season where they come to trust and know that you are with them. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you're, or I want to thank you for being with us today. We're so grateful for your willingness to come and share this, this time with us. If you're, you're here today and, and you didn't know that you could be real with God, if you didn't think that you had it enough together to ever come into God's presence, to ever come to God, I, I want to let you know that, that God is, is good with your mess. God is inviting you and your mess into a relationship with him today. And so if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you would like to today, you can reach out to me through Facebook or through our website and I I will pray with you. I can call you and text you. We can email. We can do whatever it would look like. But I would be so happy to introduce you to my friend, my Savior, and my God and allow him to change you and your life and your circumstance and your story. God loves you so much and he wants to do so much in you. Well, again, I want to thank you for being a part of us. Don't forget to click on those, those links, discover our kids' stuff, our events, ask a pastor to contact you, all of those different things. Thank you so much for being with us. We love you. We're so grateful for you. And we, we are praying that we will get to see you again real soon.